Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, it's uh, on. It's my pleasure to uh, to share and an honor to share this uh, uh, EAG webinar on this very burning topic, which is the therapeutic international uh, EUS. Today we have two presenters: one, uh, Dr. Michel Brunswick, and Dr. Joseph Pevanella. They will speak about a different procedure EUS. Uh, Guided procedure, therapeutic US procedure. Uh, today, the the schedule uh, is uh, and the top is uh, very busy, and uh, we need to uh, to start uh, uh, with the uh, first uh, uh, presentation on uh, US guided uh, gallbladder drainage. But uh, first of all, don't miss to send your abstract. Uh, is the last day uh, is uh, uh, tomorrow uh, for the EHG days uh, for the next year in Berlin. Now it's time to start. Uh, first presentation, uh, Dr. Michel Brunswick on uh, US guided gallbladder drainage. Thank you. So, uh, Mark, thank you for the uh, introduction, and uh, we'll be uh, discussing some uh, really nice therapeutic US topics today. These are my disclosures. And uh, as you said, we have a very busy schedule today, so uh, we have these uh, different topics to discuss, and we, uh, Giuseppe and I, uh, decided to uh, divide these topics uh, between us. Um, and the first disclaimer is uh, the fact that we're not going to discuss uh, pancreatic fluid collection drainage because there's been so much going on lately. I think we can fill an entire evening with this. Um, so this is not what we're going to discuss, but really shortly what we see in the latest trials is that there's equal efficacy for lambs versus plastic. And that also lambs has been associated <laughs> with the higher uh, adverse events and costs. Um, but uh, also that, uh, especially from the Dutch pancreatitis group that we see that uh, uh, immediate versus postponed drainage leads to uh, similar results, uh, potentially preventing a number of procedures. And a really interesting study has been published uh, uh, very recently in Lancet Gastroenterology, um, where we see in patients with a high and necro uh, necrosis burden that uh, even uh, same session drainage and necrosectomy is feasible and also may prevent intervention. But the last um, answers are definitely not clear here. And um, uh, again, we can fill an entire evening with this, but uh, this will be a little bit out of the scope of today. So uh, we first will be discussing US guided gallbladder drainage. And of course, the main indication here is acute cholecystitis in patients that are uh, suboptimal uh, surgical uh, candidates. So we see a, a really sick a gallbladder here with a pus inside. And what you see is that we reduced the, the, the distance between the gallbladder and the duodenum um, and entered the gallbladder with pure cut um, uh, coagulation, or a pure cutting force, uh, 110, uh, 100 to 120 watts, and then a stepwise deploy the lamb. So we use a pure cutting mode uh, for all these therapeutic AUS procedures. We uh, subsequently uh, retract the lamps on two of the walls until we see some nice tenting and then deploy the proximal flange. And this will come back in all the lamps related procedures that we'll be discussing today. And this is uh, the end result, result we all want to see, nice adequate drainage. And the question is often, do you have to dilate? In general, I do not because time will uh, do the rest of the work. So uh, if we take a look at the evidence, there are multiple retrospective case series have been published. One of the first was uh, the, uh, the series by Choi. Uh, 63 patients were included showing a high technical and clinical success. Another very interesting story to show your surgeons is the uh, study by Anthony Teo comparing uh, in a propensity score matched analysis, comparing EUS with lab uh, cholecystectomy. And what we see there is that there was a high uh, efficacy uh, and that uh, even 30-day adverse events, but also one-year readmissions and reinterventions were identical uh, in these patients with a, a high surgical risk. So very interesting data suggesting that gallbladder drainage is a really good option for those suboptimal uh, surgical patients. Um, also, uh, several systematic reviews have been published. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest is uh, the one by McCarthy, already well known in the systematic review world, I think, uh, showing a high technical and clinical success, always around 94% versus 92%. 
and adverse events rate around the 10% region. Uh, one of the most well-known RCTs we have on the topic is the DREC1 trial by Anthony Teo, uh, which was published in GUT three years ago, where uh, 80 patients were randomized to undergo either percutaneous drainage versus, uh, versus EOS. And what they saw was that EOS reduced 30-day and one-year adverse events, leading also to fewer reinterventions and readmissions. Um, supporting what we recommended in our guidelines uh, last year, um, uh, recommending that uh, US-guided gallbladder drainage should be uh, uh, preferred in centers where both techniques are present. But again, there's still nothing wrong with treating an acute and sick patient with percutaneous drainage. Uh, so uh, instead of uh, referring the patient and waiting too long, if you have percutaneous drainage for a really sick patient, do it. But if you have both techniques, EOS should be preferred in those suboptimal surgical patients. Uh, we also have some emerging data on the rescue treatment of a gallbladder drainage in malignant distal uh, biliary obstruction. I know that Giuseppe will uh, touch on this a little bit more. Personally, I am not so big of a fan uh, of this technique, mainly because uh, there are some important points to uh, uh, remember. So a cystic duct evaluation malignancy is not always that easy. Um, there was a high need for transgastic drainage, which also um, uh, increases your risk of stent dysfunction, and there's still very limited evidence. So I would only suggest this uh, if, if PTC doesn't work. Uh, hepatical gastrostomy really as a rescue therapy when you're with your back against the wall. So uh, let's already move to the tips and tricks. Um, so we uh, recommended that elective lamps exchange should be considered, uh, especially in those patients where perhaps a longer expected survival uh, is expected. So what you see also if you place the lamps uh, through a transgastic route is that a lot of food debris gets stuck in the lamps and especially those uh, patients with longer survival or transgastic placement are uh, prone to uh, lamps dysfunction. And we perform uh, lamps exchange here in those patients, pull out the lamps after three to four weeks, go in with a gastroscope and then make sure that the complete gallbladder is uh, cleared of stones, food debris, uh, you can use different tools uh, to uh, accomplish this. We often use a basket or even a rough net to completely clear out the uh, uh, gallbladder. And uh, this, of course, um, uh, makes sure that, that the risk of um, recurrent symptoms is uh, severely reduced. If you get stuck with the stone, you can always uh, perform either mechanical lithotripsy or even spyglass-assisted lithotripsy especially in those patients with giant lithiasis. And this is an approach that we copied from uh, Anthony Teo from the DRAC1 trial, so reintervention after three to four weeks. If you're planning on doing a reintervention, it's often easier to use a little bit of a bigger lamps because it will facilitate your reintroduction of the gastroscope a little bit better. So rather uh, use a 50 millimeter uh, hot axials or a 60 millimeter hot spaxis to uh, facilitate this reintervention. And afterwards, we will be uh, exchanging it for double pigtails, we'll, uh, which will be left in place indefinitely. Um, this was a video we already saw, and this is sometimes, uh, I have to admit, what sometimes happens is that you find a good location and afterwards you end up with a transgastric placement. We always try to prevent this, but sometimes due to scope manipulation, you suddenly notice, oh, it was a transgastric route. And here you have to keep in mind that there is a higher risk of lamb seclusion over time, a high risk of recurrent symptoms. And here you should really strongly consider coaxial pigtail placement and lamps exchange um, over time. So what about those patients with a high stone burden? And you can see it quite clearly here, the complete gallbladder is filled to the brim with stones. And this um, may definitely compromise a, a quick and easy lamps insertion. Um, you do not have room for deployment, and it also yeah, def therefore increases the risk of adverse events and also stent maldeployment. Um, in these cases, you can consider using a smaller lamps. Um, what we sometimes do um, is also puncture the uh, gallbladder with a 90 gauge needle and use a little bit of saline installation to create a little bit of space. Uh, in this case, as you see, it wasn't possible because it was completely filled. We could not even uh, safely access uh, a free spot in the gallbladder. 
And we also had one case where we did this and uh, the gallbladder popped like a balloon. And of course, then it becomes very, very challenging. Uh, so please keep in mind that we also have uh, alternatives in these patients and we switched in this patient to uh, transpapillary gallbladder drainage. Uh, what you also saw, you see emerging is a couple of studies suggesting a bridge to surgery, um, but do keep in mind that uh, these data are limited and what this is what the surgeons see, lots of adhesions during these operations and I know that there have been uh, studies that suggest that there's a safe gallbladder removal together with the hot axials, but this is generally what the uh, surgeons run into, lots of adhesions, and um, they reassure me that there's a higher risk of, of conversion to open cholecystectomy. There's, of course, something that we do not want in those patients. So uh, perhaps something to have a lookout, uh, to be on the lookout for in the future, to have some extra data but uh, I would advise against uh, performing this in potential surgical candidates. So uh, in my conclusions, a main indication for US guided gallbladder range is still acute and recurrent cholecystitis in suboptimal uh, surgical patients. Um, it has already been uh, proven superior to percutaneous drainage. It has some promising outcomes when compared to lab cholecystectomy. And please remember those uh, technical considerations. I told you freehand insertion of a mid-size lambs. Consider coaxial pigtails in transgastric root or high stone burden. And consider lambs exchange in those patients as well or in patients with a extended uh, life expectancy. And please keep the alternatives in mind because um, uh, percutaneous gallbladder can still be considered or transpapillary gall gallbladder drainage. So this is something to keep in the back of your mind. I do not see any uh, questions from the audience. So I'll switch to uh, you, Giuseppe. I don't know, Mark, if you have any comments uh, on that. No, I fully, uh, I fully agree with your, uh, with your, your comment uh, today. Uh, the, this technique is, uh, is uh, indicated in patient and fit for, uh, for surgery, uh, mainly uh, also for patient with, uh, uh, with a metallic stent uh, for uh, who develop uh, cholecystitis uh, with with pancreatic cancer associated in the in the, in the follow up of the of this, uh, uh, I, I I think to today the, 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 the this will replace definitively the the pectineus uh, the pectineus. Mm -hmm. Just a question for you: When the patient has ascites, is it a problem to uh, to, to to perform the the US? Uh, uh, guided uh, gallbladder drainage or not? If it doesn't interfere with your trajectory, I would still go for it if it's a good indication. If there's ascites between your trajectory, never do it because it does increase your risk of complications. Um, it is, however, very infrequent that we see ascites in that region. It's more of a problem with US guided gastroenterostomy in my personal experience. But if you see ascites in between the trajectory, I would advise against this. If you have someone uh, which um, a patient who has uh, ascites, but uh, it does not interfere, I would consider uh, using a longer uh, um, uh, antibiotic uh, treatment just to make sure that there's no serum infection. Okay, we we move for the the, the second uh, uh, presentation, which is a uh, very interesting uh, EUS guided cholecystitis to me. Please. Uh, Dr. Vanilla. Hello. Milano. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for the introduction. So we are switching now to uh, biliary drainage. And uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, we know that the RCP fails sometimes. And uh, if we want to avoid uh, morbidity uh, or discomfort of uh, percutaneous biliary drainage, use guided biliary drainage can be of help. And uh, uh, different trials and also meta analysis have suggested that uh, use guided biliary drainage is better than PTBD in terms of acute and total adverse events and in terms of brain interventions. But please acknowledge that most of this evidence was uh, uh, made when uh, we had the, uh, a sequence uh, of accessing uh, th uh, through a needle then uh, guide wire, then track creation, and then standing. So a bit uh, challenging uh, with lots of exchanges. Um, but nowadays, we have 
at the possibility to uh, uh, use uh, electrical enhanced lumina posing metal stands, so uh, uh, the possibility to create uh, uh, a fistula with uh, uh, a free end deployment and a one step uh, procedure. Uh, and this uh, has brought Colleto Cotnude and Ostomy to the stage. So, um, this is a video of the procedure, very simple procedure. You advance your uh, electrical advanced lumina posing metal stand. This is the portal vein, so you should be careful not to injure the contralateral wall. And then you open your uh, distal flange inside the dilated uh, uh, common bile duct. Then you retract the lamps to oppose the uh, um, biliary and duodenal wall. And then we go for uh, intra-channel release of the proximal flange and we push outside, we take some space and we push outside the proximal flange into the duodenum. And what we should see is uh, uh, bile coming uh, uh, into the duodenum. What we usually aim is a position towards the island. So we usually go uh, deep uh, uh, in a long position in the duodenum and then point towards uh, the island. And that should uh, uh, create a better position for the lambs not to uh, to avoid, I mean, injury of the contralateral wall and probably also reducing the risk of uh, dysfunction. Now you will see in a while yeah, a radiological confirmation of uh, uh, hair inside the bile duct. So this is the uh, uh, nice uh, uh, fact of, about the procedure, very fast, uh, very easy, but there is also a dark side of the moon, which is uh, the risk of dysfunction. And together with uh, uh, our friends from uh, Leuven and Amsterdam, we have worked a lot on this uh, topic and we have described uh, a risk of dysfunction up to 32% in these patients and duodenal invasion as an independent predictor of dysfunction. And we also proposed the Leuven Amsterdam Milan study group classification uh, of dysfunction and reinterventions in order to uh, um, standardize the reporting of these events and also to propose tailored reinterventions for these uh, dysfunction events. And we also now have recently published a, a technical review with lots of videos and uh, photos uh, uh, on these uh, reinterventions tailored to each uh, circumstances. Uh, probably in the future, we are going to prevent these events. Uh, these are interesting data by our Spanish friends, uh, suggesting that if we place a coaxial double pixel plexus tank, probably we are going to reduce the risk of recurrent biliary obstruction. However, this adds a bit of complexity to the procedure. And so they also noticed an increased rate of adverse events in these uh, uh, patients, but we are waiting for the full text of the paper. What we have now as a full text is uh, 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 one randomized trial, actually two parallel randomized trial proposing use guided collegodododenostomy with lambs as primary drainage uh, compared to ERCP with metal stents. Uh, this is one of these trials uh, enrolling mostly unresectable patients. And this study demonstrated an uh, higher technical success of choledocoduodenostomy, but this is because some ERCPs were not feasible because of uh, duodenal uh, stand, uh, stenosis. Uh, and uh, the primary outcome of these two trials was uh, one year stent patency. And this was actually similar between the two uh, groups. Uh, the other trial actually enrolled uh, an higher court of patients, so borderline resectable and locally advanced as well. And in this trial where patients with gastric heart obstruction were excluded, uh, a clinical success and technical success of the two techniques were uh, similar and the risk of stent dysfunction uh, uh, at one year was uh, similar again. Um, of course, procedure time was lower for choledocododenostomy and safety also was similar between the two uh, groups. However, if we go deeply into uh, adverse events, there is a, a non-significant trend to higher severe and fatal adverse events on uh, ERCP due to acute pancreatitis. So what our guidelines say, uh, our guidelines say that in case of failed ERCP and distal malignant biliary obstruction, we should go for use guided collegodododenostomy if this is available. However, probably this indication might change in the future due to this uh, uh, recent evidence. Hepatico gastrostomy should be reserved for ILAR uh, malignant biliary obstruction uh, according to our guidelines. And then if we have a distal malignant biliary obstruction, 
we failed our ERCP. We failed our EUS coledocodenostomy, or this is impossible because bile ducts are not so uh, much dilated, and we are able to confirm a patency of the cystic duct, we might propose is guided uh, gallbladder drainage. As Miguel said, there are now recent data. Actually, this is a small retrospective series, but this is the larger available uh, uh, nowadays, uh, suggesting a good clinical success and an acceptable safety profile. However, we should acknowledge that uh, compared to coledocododenostomy, clinical success of this technique seems a bit uh, lower, 80% versus 96%. Um, and we also have worked a bit on uh, double obstruction, so uh, the, the contemporary gastric outlet and biliary obstruction together with, again, our friends from Leuven and Amsterdam. This was the uh, cabriolet retrospective uh, uh, analysis. And uh, we uh, started to notice that uh, the combination of this procedure uh, uh, is not uh, the same as the sum of the two procedure, because as, for example, in the setting of double obstruction, Coledocododenostomy seems to work a bit, uh, not as well as in the general setting. And this was retrospective, but we now are working on prospective data on these. And uh, uh, again, we see that coledocododenostomy is not the best option, uh, in our opinion, in patients with uh, um, double obstruction. This is a case of misdeployment you can see that there's no a very uh, a, a nice dilation of the bile duct here. It was less than 15 millimeter. And uh, the axis I made was a bit perpendicular uh, to the wall. Uh, so not very I mean, in the direction of the island. And now while pushing the catheter, I uh, experienced some distance uh, uh, of the bile duct from the wall. And as you can see here, I'm trying to release my distal flange, but as you will see in a moment, this is not releasing inside. It's actually stuck between the walls. So, uh, and, and this was fully uh, opened in, in, my, in my hand. So I advanced a guideware. Uh, uh, in this case, I uh, recaptured uh, the stent, I retracted the catheter, and uh, I tried to go for a over the wire uh, uh, release. And as you can see here, not a very nice uh, position, not uh, towards the island. So I uh, had to make some movement of the scope to regain, uh, to gain a good uh, uh, direction towards the island, and then uh, I was able to advance the catheter a bit and to go for uh, the release of the uh, distal flange uh, of the uh, uh, stand uh, with some pushing uh, to, to, to let it open inside the bile duct and then uh, again retraction and uh, um, yeah, opening of the proximal flange and uh, um, now this is completely released. So my suggestion, even if this is a very simple procedure, uh, my suggestion is never walk without fluoroscopy because in case of uh, uh, adverse events, uh, the only uh, uh, salvage you can have is to have uh, uh, a guide word there to, to, to complete your uh, deployment. Um, last things, um, our French colleagues are a bit thinking outside the, of the box and proposing coledocodenostomy in resectable patient as uh, upfront drainage modality compared to ERCP uh, because they suggest that reducing the risk of pancreatitis, which is associated to ERCP, is better in patients who are candidate for, for surgery. And this is a large series uh, where patients undergo a pancreatic odudenectomy who have been drained with coledocodenostomy versus CRCP were compared, and we have an higher technical and clinical success of coledocodenostomy. Uh, but above all, we have uh, a reduced rate of adverse events of uh, uh, coledocodenostomy, both endoscopy-related and both after surgery, so surgery-related, and also a delay uh, to surgery, which is lower uh, uh, in the uh, coledocodenostomy group. The last thing, um, this is a uh, case from our group, a recent case. Uh, probably we are starting to uh, ad adopt uh, coledocodenostomy in some more 
um, in some other indications, as for example, this was a lady undergoing Ruan Y uh, hepatic jejunostomy for a trauma. Uh, um, and after 10 years, she developed a, a stenosis of the uh, anastomosis, of the surgical anastomosis. She was admitted for cholangitis with stones above the stenosis, and uh, she was initially treated with PTBD, but then uh, uh, the, dis the multidisciplinary discussion was to try to internalize this PTBD. And as you can see, the duodenum was quite close to this dilated hepatic duct, and so we were uh, we success to uh, to, to advance uh, uh, through the duodenum and uh, lumen opposing metal stent. So we went for a uh, uh, over the wire release of a lumen opposing metal stent. And after a while, we exchanged this lumen opposing metal stent for plastic stents. And after removal of plastic stents, you can see here a very nice consolidated fistula after 15 months. So we are probably also expanding uh, indications to benign setting to do the uh, uh, good removability of the uh, uh, lumen opposing metal stent. Can I ask you a provocative question, uh, Giuseppe? Sure. As as you know, I'm a I'm a big lover of the intrahepatic approaches, so hepaticogastrostomy yeah. rendezvous. So I'm I'm probably a bit biased, but years ago the surgeons um, they left uh, surgical cholecystectomy because of dysfunctions. What is needed for EUS um, to improve on to make it to make it work? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, this is a very provocative question, actually. And uh, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, we should not, I mean, get rid of coledogododenostomy because this has allowed uh, a, a nice generalizability uh, and spread of, of use guided biliary drainage in many settings. Actually, mm. this procedure can be expanded not only in tertiary uh, uh, centers. So uh, I think the easiness of the procedure is a, a point uh, 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 for coledogododenostomy, and this is not the same for uh, intrahepatic access. But you are totally uh, right when you say that uh, we should uh, uh, um, uh, think uh, about selecting the good patient for this technique because mm -hmm. uh, this is not for every anatomy uh, because, uh, as you know, we have worked a lot on this. We are experiencing uh, some uh, severe and fatal cholangitis in the setting of double obstruction in these patients. So definitely that is not a setting in w uh, where, where I will propose this um this technique and of course maybe the design of the lamps exactly, can be also yeah. a bit improved to avoid this uh, uh, let's let's say uh, high risk of ascending cholagitis but yeah it'll be interesting to see where we are in a couple of years time i think I'm, yeah. I'm not i'm not sure that the design of the lamps will change the the problem of cholidocodiodenostomy huh. because it's, it's the location of the of the, yeah. of the puncture yeah. which is a very very bad and food impaction will be the, the main uh, the, the, the main uh, the, the main problem main issue. No, I yeah. agree with you that selection of, of the patient is very 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 important to know the, the risk of complication also for the RCP um, patient with uh, with a pancreatic cancer or pancreatic or mass with uh, 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 with no dilatation of the main pancreatic duct this patient is high risk to have a, uh, an acute pancreatitis. And maybe you, you need to, to discuss um, in this case to do uh, or a, a, a corridoco or an hepatico. Um, you know that I prefer <laughs> the, the trans the hepatico gastrostomy. Mm -hmm. I think the selection of the patient also is very, very important. The size of the mm -hmm. CBD and uh, the location, the, the size of the mass, the location uh, also uh, with the, the distance with the hilum, I, everything. And I fully agree with you that you. It's very important for the people. It's easy, but the, if you have a complication, the complication is a drama for the patient yeah. because we face mainly with a, a patient with a, with a, a cancer, and this is very important. And the mild peritonitis is a drama for the for for, for the yeah. for, for the patient. And we, we need always to have a plan B. It's very important to show to use the guide wire in difficult uh, in difficult uh, situation because this can can save the, 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 the patient. And uh, Giuseppe, you know that I only perform cholodocodinostomy a handful of cases a year. Do you do you use uh, um, a guide wire preloaded on your lamps or do you use it when it's necessary? I, I 
uh, usually use it when necessary. But uh, we are seeing that in many, many use guided uh, procedures, we are going to place a coaxial pigtail. And now after the bumpy trial, probably we should place a coaxial pigtail. So Everywhere. In, in all other yeah. procedure, yeah. I have a guide wear preloaded. So probably okay. in this one, I will also start to have a guide wear preloaded, but I want to, 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 to read the full text I mean, <laughs> of, of the paper before switching to, to that. Okay, oh. it's, it's time to move now. Yeah, yeah move exactly. For the hepaticogastrostomy, Michel. <laughs> So uh, the ultimate goal in everything we do, which is biliary drainage, is to achieve complete biliary drainage. I think in the past we were happy with draining half of bile ducts, but now we want to go for complete biliary drainage. And in, in patients with bismuth 1 strictures, so subhilar strictures, hepaticogastrostomy can act as a standalone uh, modality. Um, but in, in, in patients with uh, more cl complex uh, strictures, um, uh, you should... Uh, consider hepaticogastrostomy as a very important adjunctive therapy. Um, it also <clears throat> has become a first choice modality in patients that need to undergo biliary drainage and gastric outlet obstruction, as uh, Giuseppe already told us. And we're also uh, using this in increasing amount of patients for benign disease, so hepaticogastrostomy strictures, big stones after total gastrectomy, and so on. Um, how do we achieve intrahepatic access? So uh, we tend to use an IT coach needle and 25 guide wire. In this case, uh, uh, we access here segment two. For hepatical gastrostomy, it doesn't really matter which segment you use. Some people like segment three. I think, Mark, you're a segment three man. Um, I choose whatever I like or, or whatever best position I get into. Um, after we uh, achieve access with the needle, uh, we ask the nurse to uh, aspirate, to check for bile, uh, and then afterwards uh, inject contrast. And you see here that we have a nice opacification of the uh, segment two in this case. So once we're uh, in there, we exchange for the guide wire, advance the guide wire into the bile duct, and this is a mid-CBD stricture. And you can see this is also, uh, this, of course, what we always like, that the guide wire immediately goes through the stricture. But uh, sometimes this can be very uh, challenging. And, and one of the tips is here to use, uh, you can use your cystotome as a, a diagnostic catheter to advance it in the uh, duodenum. And of course, when you have your guide wire in the duodenum, you can you have all the options. You can use rendezvous in, in, in patients where the papilla is uh, accessible. You can uh, use the guide wire uh, to perform hepatic gastrostomy or uh, uh, place an anti-grade stent. So um, when we place a hepatical gastrostomy, and this is for malignant disease, we like to uh, store a reference, a reference image just to know where our transition area is from the bile duct to the liver parenchyme. And after we inserted our partially covered stand here, I think in this case, it's a duobor, um, we start uh, um, deploying the stand. Uh, we'll ask the nurse to stop for a second and then readjust so that it will coincide with that transition area here of the liver parenchyme and then continue our deployment. And I'll uh, allude to this later on as well. Uh, what really is important here is to use traction. So uh, what we do is we stop for a second. That's what we're going to do now. Zoom out a little bit and then move ourselves towards the esophagus a little bit and and use continuous firm traction and, and intrascope release. This is what you see happening here. We're bridging the peritoneal space and then the stent is deployed. You can see already some contrast uh, running into the stomach. This is of course what we want to see. And what you see here is that we bridged the peritoneal cavity over here, the gastric wall is here, and now the stent is facing upward towards the esophagus. And you could say, oh no, it's pointing into the esophagus, that's that's no problem. What we do is we, uh, we push the uh, uh, partially covered stent towards uh, the gastric lumen. Uh, we're going to push it through here. And now you have your visual confirmation of adequate placement through the gastric wall. And what you want to see here as well is that you have a big piece of stent hanging out there uh, just as a safety net for this location. So uh, there are multiple retrospective case series published. Uh, of course, Giuseppe, I have to mention yours uh, when you were a, a fellow in Leuven. 
Uh, what we saw was a high technical success and clinical success, a per protocol clinical success of 94%. And what we also saw was that when we're using partially covered SAMs versus generic SAMs is that we see lower procedure time that stent dysfunction rate with these uh, dedicated stents and also fewer adverse events rate and reinterventions when we compare EOS hepaticogastrostomy with PTC for Hilar disease. Um, we also have some prospective data. Data One of the first registries uh, was published in Endoscopic Ultrasound in 21, uh, showing that there was high technical and clinical success, but also alluding to the fact that uh, many of these Hilar patients, we need more than one modality. So uh, uh, you shouldn't see it as a uh, standalone therapy as well in, in more complex disease, but in many cases here in 70% of patients, you need ESCP for the right side or PTC for the right uh, hepatic ducts. Uh, lots of systematic reviews as well, mainly focused on the comparisons with colodachodudinostomy. And what we see is that the high technical clinical success uh, adverse events are um, relatively frequent in those uh, studies, but uh, again, many uh, retrospective uh, um, uh, initial studies as well that were included. And uh, we have in total four or five systematic reviews comparing colodochodunostomy with hepaticogastrostomy. Two were, uh, showed similar safety uh, versus two other systematic reviews showing that colodochodunostomy might be superior. However, if we have a look at the uh, uh, Minaga, uh, the, our Japanese colleagues in digestive endoscopy, what they showed was in, in their non-inferiority trial, there were actually identical outcomes when they randomized patients. Um, of course, we're pushing the envelope again. So uh, also patients with combined obstruction, gastric outlet together with biliary obstruction. And we published our data this year, uh, comparing same session double EUS bypass. So same session hepatical gastrostomy together with gastroenterostomy versus surgery. And what we saw in those 154 patients was that uh, US led to fewer overall as severe adverse events, short time to, uh, shorter time to uh, or intake and also shorter um, length of, uh, of stay. So, um, and this despite treating patients with more, more uh, comorbidities. So uh, this is also what we do for these patients now, just drain the bile ducts and perform gastroenterostomy in one single session. So we recommended last year to uh, use and uh, reserve hepatical gastrostomy for those uh, malignant inoperable patients um, and uh, some low quality weak recommendation for uh, the safety of colodochodurostomy versus hepatical gastrostomy. Again, I'm mainly trained in uh, intrahepatic techniques, so I I'm rather con comfortable by performing hepatical gastrostomy, rendezvous, or uh, uh, anti stenting. But of course, this is depends on how you're trained. Um, for patients uh, with benign disease, what we see is that uh, we also suggest uh, hepatical gastrostomy for those patients that fail enteroscopy assisted ESCP. And especially, uh, it's useful in those patients with long limbs uh, and post surgical anatomy and malignancy. And uh, this is also how we now approach uh, hepatical ionostomy strictures is that we, um, if patients fail enteroscopy um, and we do it in the same session, so we first attempt enteroscopy as if, if it fails, we immediately switch to EOS and then perform hepatical gastrostomy with a fully covered stent. We call these patients back after one week, pull out the fully covered stent and then perform anti-grade therapy through the mature fistula. And one of the uh, advantages is that you can also easily use spyglass in these instances uh, where you can apply uh, lithotripsy or uh, take some biopsies. And as soon as we're finished uh, and we adequately uh, treated the stricture, we place a double pigtail stent connecting the efferent loop here with the bile duct and the gastric wall. And this way you can reaccess your bile duct in a couple of months time for some additional treatment. Um, we uh, submitted our abstracts, so remember to submit your abstracts. This abstract we also submitted and we compared um, enteroscopy assisted ESCP with uh, this EOS guided approach, 16 versus 19 patients. And what we see is that there's similarly, similar safety and efficacy, but a very shorter, um, a significantly shorter uh, procedure time for EOS. And uh, what we all want is uh, shorter procedures on our list uh, and don't spend two hours on enteroscopy in general. So uh, let's move on to some uh, additional tips and tricks. So there was a patient with a Klatskin uh, 
3A uh, patient, uh, uh, 3A structure, which was already uh, stented uh, on the right side in the uh, external uh, center, but the left um, hepatic ducts remained undrained. Um, so it was re the patient was referred for US guided hepatocogastrostomy. And this is a perfect indication for these patients. So we punctured, um, we accessed uh, segment three of the liver. And what you see happening here is that the guide wire uh, moves into segment two. Doesn't matter, nice, stable position. So um, this, you know, if you can deeply in insert the guide wire here, this, this isn't the issue. But what we did see during deployment is that um, there was a large part of our stent expanding inside the intraperitoneal cavity. And this uh, more, more or less candy wrapper sign, you really have to take care for this location. So always take care to leave your guide wire in place in these indications, don't lose it and make sure, and you see here the stent just hanging on by a thread user guide wire to perform bridging stent. So uh, here we placed a fully covered stent inside there to make sure that uh, uh, we reduce the risk of stent dislocation. What we definitely do not want to see are those uh, stent dislocations. And there was another uh, Klatskin 3 patient which already, uh, who already went bilateral stenting. And uh, what you see here is a dislocation. So the um, uh, proximal stent pole is actually hanging inside the peritoneal cavity, and this is very difficult to, uh, to salvage. So what you can do is get out your 90 coach needle, try to puncture the stent that you previously placed. This is, mind you, very challenging, and prepare the check with a four or six millimeter dilation balloon, cystotome dilation balloon, and then perform stent in stent placement. Uh, unfortunately, this didn't work out in this patient, and we had to send the patient uh, to surgery and had to be salvaged uh, uh, by the surgeon. So please remind to put lots of traction, continuous traction on your stand, and you can prevent this. Um, too much traction is uh, not good either. So uh, this was, uh, uh, again, a partially covered stand. Uh, which we placed and during uh, placement what we see is here the marker of the uncovered part uh, which migrated a couple of centimeters and uh, you could say you could say okay nice placement it's still it's still there but you of course risk leakage through the uncovered part of the stent and this is what you see here we just to make sure that everything was all right we injected some contrast and you can see already here some contrast leakage in the intraperitoneal cavity uh, here uh, please do not leave it like this but because patients will get pain, uh, bile, peritonitis, and we also salvage this with a fully covered stent. Again, you can prevent this with uh, continuous traction, stepwise deployment, and a good uh, communication with your nurse, nurse, and also use your reference image uh, to check for dislocation during the placement. So in this case, we can uh, place a fully covered stent inside our uh, partially covered stent, bridging the gap, so to say. Uh, so for hepaticogastrostomy, these are my conclusions. So main indication is still left-sided, left uh, uh, non-resectable uh, strictures and non-resectable malignancy. Uh, we also now know that it's uh, the preferred modality in patients with gastric outlet obstruction. Uh, and there are definitely some emerging indications for uh, benign disease and post-surgical anatomy where enteroscopy-assisted ESCP fails. Again, uh, remember not to use partially covered stents in benign disease. They will grow in and you end up with the issue there. So for benign patients, please use a, a fully covered stent. Uh, try to use a reference image to check your placement and also use adequate traction. I uh, thank you for your attention. So uh, we'll, hey. switch, we'll switch to you again, uh, Giuseppe, unless you have a question, uh, Mark. Yes, uh, no, very, very, very good, uh, very good presentation. I think to hepatico gastrostomy today is the main indication in patient with altered anatomy. This is definitive. Mm -hmm. Also, with uh, involvement of the, the of the duodenum, it's also definitive. This is the very, uh, very important. And also, I think the it's uh, you you speak and you saw very nice image about the combination uh, uh, for the complex biliary stenosis. Mm -hmm. which is very, very important, uh, in particular in patients with uh, cholangiocarcinoma or metastasis from breast or colon cancer, because today we have efficient chemotherapy. 
even now with the immunotherapy, mm -hmm. which is included in the treatment of cholangiocarcinoma, it's very, very important to drain this patient completely. And more than 50%, around 80% that we have published a paper on this. And it's for this reason that is very important because if you drain completely this patient, this patient will benefit of the of the of the of the of the, of the new uh, immunotherapy, for example, for cholangiocarcinoma. This increases the survival time of the, this patient, and it's very important to combine to combine ERCP, EOS, PTC for this complex. Uh, and uh, uh, you show this uh, very yeah, well. Yeah, it and should be a combination. New, a completely new thing. And just a, a comment for the future of hepaticogastrostomy. Probably the, 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 the complication occur because we, we, we perform too much manipulation. This is the uh, puncture, wild, cystostomes. And we hope to have very, very soon so called the hot geobore, which will change completely the, the face of the hepaticogastrostomy. When the Y is in place, you just introduce the stent mm -hmm. one step, like the like the, the axios, the lamps, but it's not the lamps, but it's a, the, the we, this is we call the hot geobore. And the, the, the first, the first uh, trial, uh, the first uh, on this uh, stand are very, uh, uh, very promising. Yeah, nice. I'm uh, looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, yes, but uh, we have a problem with the, the C mark. Eh? <laughs> if, if, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I can imagine. No comment on it. If, if you have some prototypes, send it our way. We'll uh, make it work. <laughs> Okay, we move for the next. Uh... Okay. So we now speak about uh, uh, use-guided anastomosis and use-guided gastroenterostomy. So in the treatment of gastroid obstruction, we knew from uh, uh, old data that from all trials that uh, self-expandable metal stent was a good solution for the short term, whereas surgery was better in the long term. And But if we have a procedure uh, combinating the advantages of surgery and the invasiveness of endoscopy, this should be uh, the best procedure. So uh, this is used guided gastroenterostomy. This is how we perform that, uh, uh, the, the, the technique we described together with uh, Mikiel uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, so called wireless simplified or west uh, technique so we advance a an oral jejunal tube uh, in the first jejunal loop and this tube uh, uh, allows for control distension of the jejunum for stabilizing the loop for identification of the correct target loop and for confirmation of core lamps placement upon uh, uh, yeah release of the lamps so this is what we want to see usually uh, the first jejunal loop together with the uh, oral jejunal tube inside the uh, uh, the loop and we start injecting our saline and as you can see here uh, we see the effect of injection and then after we have found a nice window uh, we can go for lamps advance uh, this is a nice window because we, we have a very uh, long operative space in the direction of the operative channel of the scope, which is on the left in our, <laughs> in our country. And uh, uh, a short distance between the two walls, this is very, very important. And so we can advance our uh, uh, lamps. We should see the so-called boiling effect. So the a perturbation of the fluid inside the loop and then we go for uh, the distal flange release. You can see here a bit of ascites. Uh, so we are a bit pushing the loop away, but we are still in. Uh, so we have to be careful in these patients. Uh, but then we uh, retract the lamps to oppose the two walls. And then we release our proximal flange. And we see some uh, uh, reassuring blue inside the stomach because we use also indigo carmine in the saline for injection and at this step if you want you can confirm your correct placement by send some contrast in the original tube and you can see contrast flowing through your lamps into the stomach. Uh, in our center, after this step, we also dilate, but I know this is not standardized, Mikkel doesn't do that. Uh, um, um, and then we can see uh, the jejunal loop through the lamps. Um, 
probably in the future we are going to uh, uh, to search to look for standardization of the technique this might be an innovation we are willing to try as for example some, this kind of catheters uh, double balloon catheters uh, uh, um, going through the scope in order to stabilize the loop and allows uh, a drainage like it was a collection um, what data say? Uh, when comparing gastroenterostomy versus surgery, uh, we, we can see that there is uh, a similar uh, efficacy uh, uh, and probably uh, an higher safety, uh, at least a shorter hospital stay and time to, 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 to food resumption. Uh, we have worked a lot on this topic together again with our friends in Leuven and Amsterdam, but I will just show here the last study on this uh, comparison uh, versus to surgery uh, demonstrating uh, equal technical and clinical success together with a uh, lower time to clinical success, lower time to chemotherapy, shorter hospital stay, and uh, uh, higher safety or is guided gastro enterostomy versus uh, surgery. When comparing gastroenterostomy versus stent, we can see a, a better clinical success for gastroenterostomy. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the, the, the main endpoint, the main difference between the two techniques is the risk of reinterventions and recurrence of symptoms, which is significantly lower uh, in uh, use guided gastroenterostomy. Uh, this was a retrospective evidence, but we are now starting to see prospective data. This is uh, a, a large Spanish series demonstrating a, uh, an amelioration of quality of life after use guided gastroenterostomy. This is our own series from Milan uh, um, uh, demonstrating a uh, Mm, I, uh, technical and clinical success with an acceptable safety profile and also proposing a subgroup comparison, prospective comparison versus enteral stent, again demonstrating higher clinical success and reduced risk of uh, recurrence. But this is, was still uh, prospective but non-randomized and we are starting now to see also randomized studies. This is the DRAGU trial uh, from Anthony Teo. Uh, uh, which has been presented as an abstract and again demonstrating in a randomized uh, fashion uh, 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 high uh, technical and clinical success actually higher for use guided gastroenterostomy than enteral stenting even if not significant and the main difference is again risk of reinterventions which is significantly higher for enteral stent. Uh, so we have described the, the technical step of the, these techniques. Let's go through misfortunes. Of course, we have some contraindications, linitis plastica, massive ascites, peritoneal carcinomatosis with multiple stenosis. So there are patients still better candidate to enteral stenting. And what about adverse events? Uh, one frequent one, but very, I mean, insignificant, clinically not relevant, is uh, sometimes bleeding. Uh, but the most feared adverse events is uh, misdeployment. This has been described in 10% of patients, but this requires surgery in 10% of this 10%, so actually 1%, 2%. And I will show you one case of ours, uh, which has been published. Um, um, so here uh, we injected through our original tube, and as you can see here, this is not a very nice target for use guided gastroenterostomy. A lot of distance here, uh, not very dilated. Uh, we thought we were in actually because we see some effect of cautery inside the loop, but then upon LAMS release, we had uh, several signs that we were not inside the loop, as you can see here. Upon re retraction, we don't see the catheter inside the loop. Upon LAMS release, we don't see any fluid coming in the stomach, so no blue dye uh, coming in the stomach. And again, upon injecting uh, through our orojejunal tube, contrast is not flowing through our stent. And uh, um, as uh, minutes were uh, passing, we also starting to see the peritoneum uh, uh, through the lambs as you 
we'll see in a while. So what we decided to do in this case, uh, and this is the importance of having an orogenal tube there, uh, we decided to restart the procedure, simply restart the procedure. We just removed the lumps. And this is uh, because we could demonstrate that there was no peritoneal leak uh, in the jejunum. Uh, so uh, the, what it was safe to start back the procedure uh, and to do another attempt. Uh, and here you can see that we have, uh, again, not a very nice window, but signs of correct placement because uh, upon lumps uh, retraction, we can see the lumps inside the loop. And uh, again, now uh, when injecting uh, a contrast through the orogejunal tube, we are seeing that coming into the stomach. So uh, uh, of gastrojejunostomy for me is something that cannot do uh, uh, without uh, a fluoroscopy and having an orogenal tube uh, is uh, 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 a comfort zone for gastroenterostomy. Um, what about expanding indication? Of course, anastomosis have also uh, uh, helped in the management of uh, post-surgical anatomy. This is afferent loop syndrome, which is actually quite uh, similar to draining a collection, but we have more uh, uh, advanced procedure. Uh, this is the eus directed transgastric ERCP or EDGE uh, in Ruana and Y gastric bypass. This allows you to inflate the remnant stomach and to connect the remnant stomach back uh, uh, to the uh, GI tract and uh, uh, to perform through the lumps ERCP or even diagnostic. QS, and then uh, uh, when you have finished it, you can remove the lumps and uh, uh, allow for fistula closure. And this is uh, another type of connection of shortcut use directed transenteric ERCP. In Ruan Y hepatic jejunostomy anatomy, you can uh, connect uh, the biliary limb to the stomach or duodenum again and perform trans lumps interventions. In this case, as for example, we uh, uh, cleaned a large intrahepatic stone over an anastomosis. Just a final indication. Uh, 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 this is one case we recently performed of an eus guided colo and rostomy. This was a patient with a recurrent uh, urothelial cancer, and as you can see, dilation of the small bowel above the obstruction. Uh, the problem with eus guided colo and rostomy is that you want to avoid a short bowel syndrome, so you had to push your uh, 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 eus scope. Uh, in the right colon, this is not always easy uh, with a lateral viewing scope. So, and this patient also had the challenge of having a left colostomy. So we advanced a colonoscope, we left the guide wire back in the cecum, and then we advanced our EUS scope uh, uh, under fluoroscopic guidance, and we found a very nice dilated ileal loop and we perform our uh, colo enterostomy. And uh, we have now a recently published uh, series of 26 patients for this indication showing that this technique is feasible. So there is also expanding experience on uh, uh, new indication for uh, use guided anastomosis. I will stop here. Yeah, okay, questions. we move, we are late. We, we move for the last, uh, the last presentation of uh... Of Michel's. Yeah, so I'll uh, skip a couple of things uh, because of uh, time constraints. So yes, uh, we know that time is Dr. running, unfortunately. Yeah. Ductal hypertension is the main driver of symptoms in chronic pancreatitis. And uh, of course, endoscopy in both uh, surgery and endoscopy are aimed at relieving pressure. If you take a look at the trials, it's mainly a failure and cannulation that drives failure of endoscopy. And this is, of course, where EUSPD comes in. And this is what you often see. So um, uh, dilated PD, stones in there, and hyperechogenic foci uh, and stones. So how do you approach these patients? We uh, puncture the PD with, uh, we start out with a 19 gauge needle in, in this case. We inject some contrast, again, first aspiration, then contrast, and insert a guide wire and exchange for the ESP. Very easy, it is not. Um, once the guide wire is in there, we exchange for the ESCP scope and then uh, either uh, advance the guide wire next to the guide wire or pick it up. This sounds easy, but it is definitely not again. So um, once we have access to the PD, we dilate uh, any underlying strictures, remove stones, and then if we're certain about ductal clearance, we place uh, a final stent to, to uh, provide uh, drainage long term. Long -term. 
Um, of course, DSOP or uh, uh, digital single operator pancreatoscopy has really changed uh, the way we approach these uh, patients because now we can really one see um, that we uh, cleared uh, the ducts, but also uh, facilitate electrohydraulic uh, lithotripsy. And this is a large stone that we cleared. And what you want to see is that that duct is completely cleared and that we uh, recanalize the PD. So this is. Uh, uh, our dream lithotripsy. Um, again, I'll skip over the studies quite quickly. So there is a significant technical and clinical success. But again, uh, the main point here is that safety wise, there are more complications. So 15 to 30% complications, mainly due to pancreatitis. Um, and this also make us uh, recommend that uh, this only should be performed in symptomatic patients where ESCP has been fail uh, has failed, but also to only do this in high volume expert centers because of the complexity and high risks involved. And also um, we should aim at performing rendezvous as we're uh, convinced that using the normal anatomical route uh, will lead to uh, lower adverse event rates and better outcomes. So uh, one of the uh, main questions we often get is what do you use 20 gauge or a 22 gauge or 19 gauge needle? Uh, the thing that you have to know is that uh, you can use a 20 gauge needle. Uh, it will be easier to access the PD, but it does not accommodate a cystotome. Um, it, you have a reduced pushability and also the visibility, as you see on the right, it's a very fine guide wire. So that's the reason that we often start with the 90 gauge and a 25 uh, guide wire. If we cannot get in, we'll switch to the 22. Uh, another um, uh, issue we often uh, address is the fact that uh, attempting rendezvous, uh, rendezvous with just a guide wire is really difficult. So in most of these uh, cases, we advance a cystotome through the gastric wall, and then in the PD, we use it as a more or less of a diagnostic catheter. And what we see in our uh, retrospective, uh, our own data, is that um, uh, in, in half of our successful rendezvous, actually a cystotome was required to get you through the papilla. So uh, using the guide wire alone um, will not, uh, in many cases, will not uh, lead to a successful rendezvous. You need something more like a catheter or a diagnostic catheter or a cystotome. Um, I already showed you these movies and this is what we often see is that accidental guide wire advancement is seen through the minor duct, uh, through the minor papilla instead of the major papilla. And we always wondered, uh, do the, these patients um, um, have similar efficacy and safety of our procedures. And that's why we uh, compared our outcomes of a minor versus major papilla. And what we see is that there were no significant um, statistical significant difference in clinical success and adverse events. And most importantly, recurrent pancreatitis was almost identical. So I think the bottom line is if it comes out of, of either papilla, be happy and take it. So um, what if a rendezvous fails? In that case, we uh, place a seven French pancreatic gastrostomy uh, to uh, uh, preserve our drainage. And then we call these patients back in three to four weeks and attempt another rendezvous. And in, in the majority of cases, and I can only remember a handful of cases, in the majority of cases, this works. So we uh, cannulate beside the stent or pull out the stent and then cannulate. And in the majority of cases, we can uh, in a second intervention, still perform rendezvous. If this should fail, what you can do is uh, dilate and insert your cholangioscope and then perform lithotripsy if required. Um, so also this is what we did in this case. We also cleared the duct here of stones and we also removed with spyglass the broken guide wire that you saw in there. So the tools are endless, of course. So we uh, just to make sure that there was no foreign body uh, uh, left, we also pulled out the guide wire. Um, and we then inserted the guide wire and performed rendezvous. So uh, this is a challenging patient with a uh, ruptured duct. Um, here, rendezvous wasn't possible either. So we performed pancreatic gastrostomy and also retrograde stenting through the papilla. Um, and then we called the patient back after three to four weeks. And then uh, with the use of spyglass, we could um, perform lithotripsy and also integrate uh, guide wire placement and rendezvous. What we typically see in this, uh, these duct rupture patients is that the place of the duct rupture becomes very fibrotic and very challenging to, to place a stent. And 
a couple of important tips that I can give you here is that you really have to be sure that the duct is drained. So go in there with spyglass and make sure that it's clean or any uh, cholangioscope that's on the market now. Um, uh, use adequate dilation and make sure that the strictures are adequately managed. And what is also a nice tip is to ask your nurse to pull on the uh, rendezvous guide wire that's still hanging out of uh, the patient's mouth. And what you can create is a more or less a guitar string effect, and she can actually help you pull in the stent. It's what the, the guys in Amsterdam called the body floss. Uh, I use a guide wire technique of the, the guitar string technique. Well, you can use the, your nurse to pull you in with your stand. So that's a, a good tip for these really tight, hard strictures. So uh, uh, we'll already get to our conclusions. Uh, so the main indication for EOSPD is failed retrograde cannulation and symptomatic ductal hypertension. Don't do this in patients with asymptomatic stones and duct dilation. Um, and remember those technical considerations I told you, uh, 90 gauge needle and then switch to 22 if you cannot get in. Use a catheter to aid you in wire manipulation for rendezvous. We now know that my, my, minor and major papilla are more or less the same. Uh, consider temporary pancreatic gastrostomy and also uh, pancreatic scopy to uh, adequately clear your ducts. And we're currently working on our RCT, uh, including these techniques and comparing full ductal clearance with surgery. And I think this will be a more of an honest comparison with surgery than the trials that are already out there. Very, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. I think uh, we are late. We have uh, seven minutes more. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, to congratulate the, the, the two uh, uh, presenters. We the quality of the uh, the quality of the, uh, the the movies of the image and uh, the quality also of the data presented it was very important that this technique uh, we need uh, to to learn this uh, EUS technique in parallel with the to learn uh, the RCP this is very very important because uh, uh, EUS, uh, therapeutic US will not replace the RCP. And we need to work to, uh, to learn this technique together in parallel because we need uh, many manipulation that we, we perform with the RCP. Uh, we have the same manipulation, for example, the insertion of stent and deployment of stent. And I think this is very, very important for, for the, the, young, uh, the, the young endoscopist uh, we uh, were connected uh, with us uh, this uh, uh, this evening. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for the AGE to to organize this kind of uh, of uh, webinar. Here you see the, the the next webinar. It was the the 13 December on the uh, on the bowel cleansing, which is also a very very uh, very important. And uh, again, don't miss to uh, to send your abstract. Uh, for the uh, EAG days in uh, uh, Berlin in April 25-27. The last day is uh, today. No, tomorrow. Sorry, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Gentlemen, it was my honor. It was a pleasure as well. See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Good evening for everybody. <laughs> <laughs>